Welcome to today's event, Launching into the Space Age with Naoko Yamazaki. Uh, Ms. Yamazaki is a leading mind on space policy issues, and we are delighted to have her not only as a speaker today, but as a virtual visiting fellow at Perry World House this past year. She's an astronaut and a space policy expert. She earned a master's of engineering degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Tokyo, and then started working for Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency. In 1999, she was selected as an astronaut candidate, went on to qualify as a flight engineer in 2004 and a NASA mission specialist in 2006. And on April 5th, 2010, she was aboard Space Shuttle Discovery as part of the crew STS-131, an assembly and resupply mission for the International Space Station. She retired in 2011 and has served as a member of Japan's Space Policy Committee since uh, 2012, uh, the, the chair of Women in Aerospace under the Japan Rocket Society since 2015, and a representative director and co-founder of the Spaceport Japan Association since 2018. Uh, thank you, Ms. Yamazaki, for joining us for today's event and for having been such an incredible member of the Perry World House uh, community over the past year. You have uh, woken up early for us. You've stayed up late in Japan to speak with faculties, uh, with fellows, with Penn students, and we truly uh, appreciate it. And so now, uh, Ms. Yamazaki, the floor is yours for some remarks, followed by a moderated uh, conversation and questions from uh, the audience. So thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks so much, Michael, for the kind introduction. And it is my great pleasure to join in the Perry World House Space Workshop, launching the new space age. Well, uh, as a fellow, a uh, visiting fellow, I'm so delighted to communicate with each of you. And I'm looking forward to uh, Q and a sessions later. So let me share my screens. Yes, as uh, Michael uh, kind of introduced, uh, I was in charge in our ISS assembly and resupply mission in 2010. And after that, uh, I've been serving as a space policy committee and also on the council of the Earthshot Prize. And actually this Earthshot Prize was initiated by Prince William uh, a year ago, and it got an inspiration from the president Kennedy's moonshot which was declared exactly 60 years ago. So I'm honored to be a part of this Arsha Prize as well. It's in the aim is to make impossible possible, like moonshot. So to find some path to save our home planet in the next decade, especially in the environmental issues. So why we are in new space age now? Uh, there are several reasons. In the first one is we have a shift in the international collaboration. As you know, the International Space Station is a symbol of 50 nations collaboration. US, European countries, Japan, Canada, and Russia. And uh, the commitment is until 2024. However, after that, Russia expressed its intention to leave the program and develop its own space station. And Russia is preparing to launch a new module to the ISS, which is called Nauka, which means science. And this Nauka module has the capability to uh, generate power and keep some pressurized and habitable function domains. So after 2024, Nauka will be separated from ISS and then functioning as an its own uh, space station. And China is also constructing its own space station, uh, Tianguan, and the uh, completion will be uh, probably by the end of next year. And as you notice, you know, the element was already in a, a orbital and the China's long March 5 Bravo core uh, system was re-entered into the atmosphere and actually in the ocean in an uncontrolled way. So which caused an issue to for the space debris and uh, uncontrolled re-entry of such a huge element. So, and another international collaboration shift in a lunar uh, beyond uh, deep space exploration. So after ISS, Artemis program will be running. 
and so far, the Artemis Accords were signed among the US, Japan, UK, Canada, Italy, Australia, Luxembourg, UAE, and Ukraine. However, uh, Russia is not signing in it. And uh, Russia and China are planning to create moon base. And that project is open to international partners. Right now we have two independent lunar base projects. But I'm really looking forward to the Artemis program because you know it will send a first woman and the first person in color onto the moon. And another reason is we are facing the breakthroughs of the private sectors. Uh, on the left side is a space shuttle cockpit. There are so many mechanical switches, and we had to operate space shuttle manually to dock to the ISS or undock from the ISS or at the last moment to the land on the runway. However, the recent SpaceX Crew Dragon cockpit is very simple thanks to the touchscreen panels, but not only, you know, it became simple, it has a fully autonomous functions, which means it can launch dock to the ISS and dock and land or actually splash down on the ocean fully autonomously, except anything happened. So that opens up a new era of space travels as well. And Inspiration4 is planned something later this year or early next year, and all four crew members are space travelers. Of course, one of them is a former NASA astronaut, but however, uh, you know, all four, uh, you know, are the space travelers. And Virgin Galactic is planning to make a commercial flight uh, sometime later this year or next year. And recently, a Japanese billionaire, Yusaku Maizawa, uh, announced his plan to fly to the ISS on board the Soyuz in December this year. And he will also fly around the moon in a starship of the new vehicle of SpaceX. So Starship is a next generation required dragon. So it's fully reusable. And uh, I'm excited to see interdisciplinary fusions, especially among the automobile industries and space industries. Like uh, Toyota uh, is developing a pressurized lunar rover together with JAXA. And of course, in SpaceX and Tesla are close relationship under the Elon Musk's leadership. And interestingly, the same material used in a Starship, which is an aluminum and stainless, is used in a Cybertruck for Tesla. So it has a very strong and it even protects uh, the bullets. So this kind of synergy between two different industries of course, import of some space domain is increasing. And uh, President Trump uh, said space is the world's new war fighting domain. And Russia, China, France, and UK, Israel, and even Japan and NATO has a space force or space de self-defense. So uh, of course, Outer Space Treaty uh, signed in the later 60s, of course, you know, promises its space as a peaceful, common space. However, uh, the security bars and the space domain is getting more and more important. And lastly, the sustainability purpose in space. And of course, SDGs are common goals uh, among the nations and the space for SDGs program are running intensively. Japan is contributing space for SDGs by providing uh, opportunity for uh, developing countries to release its CubeSats from the ISS through the keyboards, Japanese experimental modules, airlocks. And uh, American company, uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, is you know, providing an opportunity for students to make a microgravity experiments on board the Dream Chasers space vehicle. So uh, let me introduce a little bit about the Japanese space policy as well. Uh, 
a Japanese space policy, actually space basic plan is revised every five years. And the recent plan was revised last year. So under the chair of the uh, Prime Minister Abe at the time. And its aim is to become an independent utilization. So what independent, which means, you know, we, it owns uh, independent launch systems. So the cabinet uh, supports space launch activities in general and also ensuring uh, space security and actually national security slow space assets and strengthening space utilization. So Space Act laws were enforced three years ago in Japan so that the private sectors can launch their satellites into space. And legislation for upcoming new activities like a space resources or suborbital flights and the new commercial spaceports. And uh, I'm belonging to the Space Policy Committee, which is an advisory board this uh, uh, space basic plan. And nations, you know, owing satellites are increasing currently more than 50 nations own their own satellites. However, only 11 nations and regions own their own rocket vehicles activities. So uh, this kind of autonomous is important, which is we consider. And not only the government launch vehicles, right now the commercial launch vehicles are emerging in Japan as well. And my activities are related to spaceports. So by opening up multiple spaceports in Japan, uh, we are aiming to make a hub in Asia area. So we are working together with 40 corporate members and 10 local governments. And we presented a spaceport city concept last year, which is an a fictional spaceport city. But uh, we are hoping to have such a uh, spaceport around Tokyo area to be a hub of the point-to-point -point transportation. So point-to-point -point transportation means uh, which uses spacecrafts, not airplane, uh, rocket engine spacecrafts. And they fly, you know, closer to space and connect to major cities less than one hour or two hours. So right now the military forces has an, you know, strategy to develop their you know, personnel to anywhere in the world within 24 hours. However, this point to point gets available, then it would connect the, you know, anywhere in the world less than an hour or two. So it would change all the operations. So I, that's why I think it's very important. And uh, this spaceport city concept is what's featured. Uh, in many uh, media last year. And why, you know, having space watch in Japan, of course, you know, Japan is surrounded by ocean. So it is easier to, you know, secure the safety air zones. And uh, Asia, there are not so many launch sites yet. So uh, Japan uh, could be a hub. And also Japan has a strong background in aerospace general industries, including airlines and the new space. And so for uh, Hokkaido has a vertical launch site and the key is a closer to the center of Japan has a vertical spaceport as well. And the southern port uh, Oita and uh, Shimoji Shima in Okinawa has a horizontal spaceport and they are aiming to initiate launches uh, in a year or two or three so already this decade so that's my activity and uh, so that's why you know we are facing the new era of space age and I'm very much looking forward to the further discussion with you Thanks so much. I mean, that was a that was a fascinating presentation and really, you know, tees up I think the conversation well. And I, I want to start by by asking you about the the International Space Station. 
Now you, you mentioned the International Space Station as a real focal point for cooperation between you know, all of the countries with space programs, but you, know, you also mentioned that Russia is, is leaving. Right. So what do you think Russia leaving will, will mean for the, for the future of international space cooperation? And what, and what was it like working with, and how did that cooperation work when you were there? I mean, were you working with Russians on the space station? Yes. Uh, you, you know, it was good to have a Russian as a partner for the ISS because, you know, uh, when a space shuttle got an accident, Russia has a manned space vehicles. So Russia took astronauts from the US or from Japan and from, you know, other countries. So it is nice to have a multiple functions together so we can compensate the functions. So it is nice to have uh, several options. However, after the Russia is leaving, but uh, SpaceX has an manned spacecraft capabilities and Boeing will have unmanned spacecraft capabilities pretty soon. So US have, you know, multiple choices. So that means, you know, this ISS planet is secured. So I'm very pretty much, you know, comfortable after, you know, Russia leaving, but still, you know, the ISS function could be functional if all the partners agree. But the extension is still under Co co coordinations. So it's not decided yet. So moving from, from Russia to, to China, on that, on that same slide in your presentation, you mentioned mm -hmm. some of China's space ambitions. And, and in, you know, in the United States, there's a, there's a lot of conversation, of course, ongoing about the, about the rise of China and about uh, China's growing interest in programs in, uh, in space. What do you think are the prospects for cooperation with China in the in, in, in the space realm and in, and in your and in your your roles? Have you engaged at all with uh, with the Chinese with you know the Chinese space program? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a very you know difficult question. Well, you know, of course, as an astronaut, uh, I consider all the, you know members of you know space flyers and as in colleagues and we have an association for space explorers which includes all the nations of who have flown to space including china of course us and japan but uh, at the same time you know the competition race is so getting severe between you know china and uh, us and, and japan and western countries and uh, the legislation, USA legislation prohibits to put the government money into the cooperation with China in space program. So NASA cannot cooperate with China officially. That's the law. Uh, and Japan doesn't have its strict law, but uh, of course, under the USA and the Japan alliance, uh, Japan is following the USA's policy. So we are not cooperating with China officially. But uh, when, you know, looking back to the history, even, you know, there was a Vietnam War and a Cold War, Russia, at that time, Soviet Union and USA had a cooperation in the space program, like an Apollo and a Soyuz docking space project was initiated in, in the 70s. And after the Vietnam War was ended, then it actually succeeded to dock Apollo and the Soyuz. Two spacecraft was docked in the orbit. So like that, probably we might be able to have some communication channel between China and you know uh, Western countries, I hope, especially for the academia earlier, because recently China returned the lunar samples. And it has a very, you know, important samples for academia and all the researchers. And if we could share those data, it would be wonderful. So probably we might be able to, you know, consider some areas we can cooperate with China as well. So shifting from, from talking about Russia and in China, you know, you, you mentioned in your answer the the you know Japan's relationship with the United States, and I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about the about the Artemis program, mm -hmm. 
and the the role of of U.S. Japan uh, of U.S. Japan cooperation, you know, in this new program uh, designed to to really move exploration uh, forward. And you know, what, you know, what's what some of the goals are, and, and how you think it's going. Mm-hmm. Yes, the Artemis program uh, is uh, aiming to expand our frontier to deeper space because ISS is, you know, the low Earth orbit. So we need to expand our activities from low Earth orbit to lunar and beyond to Mars eventually. So uh, we are developing together the Gateway Space Station, which is, you know, around the lunar orbit. And with that gateway station, we can send astronauts occasionally onto the moon with the landers. Then, uh, you know, it will return samples from the lunar surface. So our gateway will be an outpost to the lunar base activities and also the Mars activities in the future. And Japan uh, is committing to the Artemis program by providing the cargo transportation capabilities and also providing a lunar pressurized rover developed by Toyota and JAXA. So could you tell us a little bit about what you think that uh, you know, sort of ta- building on the on the Artemis program and the idea of of landing the first woman on Mars as the mm-hmm. as the second you know Japanese woman to ever go into space, and as someone who advocates for women in aerospace and STEM, what do you see as the role of uh, of of gender equality in space, and how can we use space exploration as a way to to improve gender equality in uh, mm-hmm. you know in, in in STEM as well as in space exploration directly. Yeah, this is a very important topic, you know, gender equality uh, in space areas, in the STEM areas are vital because, uh, of course, the diverse is power. And at the same time, space program has a good resource for education. So through space programs, you know, so many people get inspired, like Apollo moon mission inspired so many people, not only in the USA, but in the world. So those kind of things will happen in the Artemis program. It will inspire the younger generations in the world. And uh, I think, you know, working together between, you know, all the genders is important. So as a chairman of Soraja, which in the women in aerospace, and uh, as an uh, uh student who got a scholarship from Amelia Earhart uh, scholarship. I really appreciate those kind of, you know, encouraging program. So because still in Japan, only less than 10% women is in STEM field, especially in engineering area, oh, a little bit more than five or 6%. So we need to improve more. Just to, to push you a little bit on that, what do, what do you think we could do to improve? I mean, you know, if you, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you got to run the show, how would we, how do we get more women uh, excited and working in, in STEM fields and excited about space? Yeah. You know, recently, the new astronauts in NASA is 50-50. So half ratio is women, which is very good. I really appreciate it. But in Japan, only 10% of all the applicants are women for astronaut program because there are few women in STEM. So we need to increase the STEM, you know, female force to encourage women more in the aerospace area. So that's why uh, I'm, you know, doing space education. But uh, I think, you know, the networking is important because when I was a chance to study at the University of Maryland for one year as an exchange student, I could meet so many role models. And one of them is a female uh, helicopter pilot who was over 70 years old, who was very charming. And she told me with a big smile, oh, it is so much fun to fly helicopter. And I was very surprised (laughs) because maybe I had an unconscious bias of a helicopter pilot. 
So I think, you know, to get rid of those unconscious bias, to meet various people, to have a role models. So I think those kind of networking is important. So I, I think, you know, the Perry World House uh, is encouraging the diverse students, so which is very nice. Well, thank you. And, and while, we're, while, while we're talking about World House, of course, you know, our, our audience is you know, not only people interested in the policy world, but, but Penn students. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so uh, we're going to move on to some other topics in a, uh, in, in a minute. I really want to talk to you about private enterprise kinds of questions and, and the spaceport. Uh, but what, what kind of advice would you have for, uh, for students, whether at Penn or elsewhere, you know, interested in, in getting engaged on, on questions of space? Sure. You know, there are so many opportunities right now for students to participate in a space program. Like, an, uh, you know, the academia conference, of course, and also these kind of webinars. And even, you know, if you are in a STEM area, the CubeSat project are very popular in universities. So just, you know, join in those activities and then you will expand your you know, perspective and you will get more networking. So I'd like to encourage yeah, each of your activities. Well, great. We are turning to, we have a lot of questions coming in in the, in the Q&A and, and a lot of these questions focus on the, on the question in, in one way or another on the question of private enterprise and the role of private enterprise in, in space. And you know, one uh, you know, what one question asks about, and it's going back to that the first question I asked you about Russia's withdrawal from the International Space Station, sort of asked her, you know, so private companies are filling the void that will be left by by Russia. You know, what what do you think will be will be different as as private companies, whether SpaceX, whether whether Boeing, are getting more involved in in you know space activities that, that maybe countries were previously doing. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, it is, you know, very sad to have Russia leaving the ISS. But uh, of course, you know, more private sections, you know, coming into the ISS program is very nice. I would like to encourage it. And, but it is not easy because the ISS is, you know, considered as a national love in the USA. So half of the resources are used by NASA and the rest of the half is utilizing with various uh, research organizations among the USA, including NIH and so on. And still, you know, we need government money to uh, encourage the demands from various research. So we need to work harder in the upcoming next year, you know, couple of years so that we can, you know, handle over to the commercialization after 2024. Sure. And what, how do you think we, how do you think we should imagine what or I'm trying to think of the right way to ask this question. Uh, sorry, there's a question. Let me just ask actually the question in the in the Q&A, which is which is written <laughs> just fine. Do you think more regulations need to be placed on private space industries? If so, you know what um, kind of regulations do you think are most important? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, based on the spaceport experiences, the regulation on safety for human spaceflight is important. I think, because right now FAA, AST, and Commercial Transportation Department has a kind of regulation for space travel, but uh, it is based on the informed consent, and it will guarantee, of course, a public safety, and but it won't guarantee. It, it's not guaranteeing for the. Uh, crew member safety. It is based on the informed consent. So we understand the risks and then take a risk to fly to space. Well, at the beginning, that's totally fine. But later on, if it's in a commercial base, especially for the point to point transportation, we need more safety regulations. So we need to work on. And FAA is telling, you know, it's an ongoing process because we don't have so much know-how at this point. So as the project is going on, then we get more feedback from the technical data and then we can revise the regulation. So that's kind of an iterating process. All right, so space point-to-point -point transportation sounds super cool. 
-hmm. So tell me, tell me how, how soon, you know, how long before I can get on, mm -hmm. uh, before I, I, I can, I can use some space point to point transportation and, and how expensive do you think it'll be? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it would be nice, you know, if I can travel to, you know, USA with less than one hour, that's my hope. And many people is expecting it's happening in 2040s, but a SpaceX Starship is getting ready in 2023, it's gonna fly around the moon. And probably in the mid 2030s, the Starship is utilized as a point to point vehicle as well. So it is a good strategy to use the same Starship vehicle for the lunar exploration and point-to-point -point vehicle. So it can utilize the mass production effect so that it can decrease the cost as well. So, you know, uh, my expectation is perhaps sometime in the 2030s, point-to-point -point will be commercialized and the cost will be probably the same or a little bit higher than the first class travel in an airplane. That's not bad. Um, all right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to hold you to it. And <laughs> the, we have a, another question that, that asks, uh, considering the new space age and the potential for space business and you know, economic ventures in space, you know, do you think that Japan's space agency will think about selecting business professionals as future astronauts? Oh. Will, will astronauts need to be, have a business background in the future, if the if you know if a lot of the future of, of, of space involves economics, yeah, sure. I think it, there is possibility, of course, because you know JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, is hiring new astronauts this autumn, and they are considering to opening up the uh, prerequisite before uh, only STEM science major. Uh, uh, allowed to apply for an astronaut corps, but uh, they are considering to expand its criteria to non-science areas, including business. So I'm really hoping, you know, various background, uh, you know, people will go up to space. But, you know, in the USA, interestingly, they restrict more uh, for the mm. astronaut criteria before they require only science, uh, you know, graduation from college, but now, you know, NASA is requiring master's degree in science because probably the Artemis project is more challenging and it probably requires more science background. But later on, you know, I think, you know, more background will be uh, important, beneficial to the team. So I think, you know, it will be expanding. And interestingly, Europe, ESA, European Space Agency, is hiring new astronauts, and they mm. are hiring uh, people with physical disabilities. So, of course, the vehicle is not ready to fly in disabilities, but uh, of, but still, you know, yet yeah, ESA is planning to consider how you know space is more accessible to more people. I think which is very good. So the, if, if, you know, if, if we're all in space in the 2030s, you know, he, he, heading around and, and, and exploration of, uh, of, of Mars, of other places is, is picking up, what does that mean for the problem of, of orbital debris or what's called uh, space junk? Well, does that mean that there'll be, there'll be more? And what, what are the consequences? What do we do about it? Yep. Uh, yeah, space debris, it's good. A bigger problem. And we was on board the space shuttle for 15 days. We got a hit of small space debris to the, into the windows and it didn't go through, but uh, we had a cracks, at least three cracks during the 15 days. So it happened. And even a small space debris has a strong energy. It's, you know, rotates around the Earth, you know, eight kilometers per second. So, which is much faster than the bread. So, okay, just, uh, just and, like, can I stop? That, that's really sure. scary. It is. It is. 
but the space, you know, manned spacecraft, space shuttle or crew dragon on ISS, it's strong enough to withstand up to one centimeter space debris. So which is a design and secured. But, and of course there are much bigger debris as well. And the debris bigger than 10 centimeter can be monitored from the ground. And the big debris approaching to the ISS U.S. Air Force and some other, you know, organization will give a warning to the ISS or other satellites, and they will, you know, escape from the space debris, controlling the attitude and uh, uh, altitude sometimes. So those kind of maneuver is happening, well, three or four times each year for the ISS, mm -hmm. and the frequency is getting higher. So wow. I think we need to work starting now. And because SpaceX is launching Starlinks, you know, hundreds of satellites. And so those kind of satellite constellation is happening in the next decade. Then some probability in satellites get, you know, lost or broken its controllability. So that's the problem. So is, is there a way to is there a way to clean up space debris? I mean, do we need to to invent technology to you know like the I mean I'm 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 I, I have no idea and I'm stupid and so but the the no, equivalent no, no. to vacuum it up essentially or to you know how how do we you know we, we presumably want to avoid a situation in which you know we have more and more satellites and and in the space stations having to maneuver you know dozens of times a year mm -hmm. to avoid uh, to avoid debris. You know, how do we, yeah. is there a way to reduce the amount of debris? Mm -hmm. So uh, the United Nations has a guideline. And first, we should reduce the debris uh, by not causing debris issues. So the satellites need to have a function after its lifetime, then re-enter to the atmosphere so that it won't stay in orbit and so on. And, but still existing debris are, you know, so many. So we need to actively remove those existing debris. So there are several methods. One method is using magnets because satellites are made of metals and the magnet will catch the space debris and then re-enter to the atmosphere altogether. Or, uh, you know, like you mentioned, some adhesive, you know, uh, materials will catch uh, space debris and so on. But it's not easy. It's hard because all, you know, the debris is rotating around the Earth eight kilometers per second. It's sometimes in a tumbling. It's not in a stable of attitude. So to approach it safely and catch it is hard. But once we have those technologies, it will can, you know, have more potentials. For, for example, we can refuel the satellite and we may be able to expand its lifetime by approaching to the satellite. Or we can repair the broken satellite. Or we can do some, you know, manufacturing in space. So those kind of technologies are key elements in the next space operations. All right, so I'm, I'm excited about point-to-point -point space travel. I'm scared <laughs> of space debris. <laughs> and now, now I want to hear, but I want to hear a little more actually about some of the technologies just you just mentioned. How how would you refuel a how would you refuel a satellite or or, or repair it while it's while it's out there? Mm -hmm. Already there are some experiments going on in ISS or the satellite basis, and uh, just you know approach and dock to the satellite and uh, to you know, transfer a liquid fuel to a satellite. And yeah. Wow. And that's incredible. The, yes, it is. I mean, like an the, aircraft. This is genuinely incredible. The, mm -hmm. Could you, uh, we've got a couple questions here in the Q&A asking about, sure. uh, about space exploration and settlements. Now, I know mm -hmm. this is a much sort of longer term question, but you know, what do you think is a reasonable timeline for, for you know, the, the, the first space settlement, whether on, on the moon or, or Mars or, or someplace else? Well, uh, mm, I think on the moon, you know, it will not be far away. It could be, you know, 20s, 30s, 2040s. Yes. 
But for Mars, you know, the first men or women we will land on Mars probably in 2030s, 2040s, and then it will, yep, increase its activities. And for Mars, it's, you know, much more challenging than on the moon because it has to consider the planetary protection to protect the Mars environment. For the moon, you know, we all understand, have a consensus, there is no life on the moon. Mm. So we can send spacecrafts on the moon without any specific treatment. But the Mars has some potential, uh, you know, possibility to have lives on it. So we have to, you know, uh, make special treatment of the uh, surface of the uh, rovers and whatever landers to send to Mars. So it has uh, uh, big technologies. That's great. The, yes. the I mean, that, that that's sort of amazing. I mean, is there, are, are, are there just, I mean, Mars is kind of loomed large as the next, sort of the next place to go. I mean, ever, ever since, you know, you know, I, I, I was a kid in, in some ways. And what, what's next after Mars? Oh, good question. Well, I think, um, well, I think it's kind of actually in parallel to send human to Mars. I think it's like an, you know, lunar orbit to make some uh, space colonies or space station between Earth and the moon, like a Lagrange point and so on. Because by having such an, you know, a uh, station between the Earth and the Moon, it will be able to provide some solar power energy back to the Earth, or it could, you know, be utilized as in factories. Right now, all you know, many factories or power plants have some uh, burdens to the Earth environment, but if we, we can outsource those functions to space, maybe we can protect our environment on the Earth. So that's my hope. Cool. I mean, this, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show, The Expanse, but, uh, but th this has a very expanse like feel to me and kind of where you're and kind of where you're going. And the, the, there's a, a question in the, in the Q and A, that asks actually mm -hmm. about this from more of an economics angle about the sure. when people, you know, when 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 you have discussions of things like asteroid mining, as as some of those stretch goals that that those interested in space from a private industry perspective talk about, mm -hmm. you know, how uh, how realistic and how you know how feasible do you think that those kinds of plans are at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, recently Japanese. Uh, our asteroid explorer returned its samples from Ryugu asteroid. And uh, it has, well, some organic elements and also it has some rare metals. And, you know, some startup companies, uh, I think it's, our astro, well, astro, something astro resource and so on, have a list of many asteroids and it estimates their values. And the Ryugu asteroid, for example, has a value of 0 0.1 uh, trillion uh, US dollars. But it is difficult to return samples from asteroids or resources from asteroids. It costs so much. So it's not payable. So I think, you know, if we, the space resources are not you used to return to the Earth, but they are used in space. So for example, if the resources can be bring back to on the moon base, then the moon base has some factories. They, they can manufacture some satellites or new space vehicles. Then it can launch from the moon base to a deeper space to Mars or some more far away asteroids. Then it will get cheaper. So that in that way, the space resources are uh, utilized in every you know nations and company, including Japan, is now you know watching closely to the asteroid and resources. Wow! All right, this is incredible. I'm so excited. The one thing that could maybe distract from some of these visions, though, is is what 
what I think, you know, you, you, you know, reference this in your opening remarks and, and we, you know, we've kind of gotten at it with a few of the questions, but is mm -hmm. what many perceive as growing, growing militarization of space and growing mm -hmm. competition in space, um, both sort of space as a domain in its own right and space as a domain that has, you know, significant military consequences for, for back on, for back on earth. What do you think the, the consequences are of, of growing space militarization for these, you know, these visions of what, what, what exploration could look like, what economic mm -hmm. development can look like, et cetera? Yes. Space should be used in a, in a purpose of a peaceful use, of course. However, to protect the space assets, for example, the space satellites, it's very important. I think it's important to, you know, secure the space assets because our lives are relying on space assets so much recently in this current era. For example, GPS, you know, we rely on everyday life. Without it, we cannot navigate, of course, our own automobile cars, but also the military depend on the GPS navigation so deeply. So without it, we cannot fly our, you know, F-35 or we cannot fly in any aircraft. So we have to protect it. And uh, to protect it, we need our technologies. So I think, you know, through our, you know, securing the space domain and increasing the technologies is important. But at the same time, peaceful use should be, uh, you know, protected among every nations. And of course, you know, Japan is a, is a country with a very, a very particular constitution that, that you know, limits Japan's uh, military activities you know, how are, uh, you know, how are you as a, as a former Japanese astronaut, as someone working on, um, you know, for, you know, with, with the government on a variety of space uh, issues, how is Japan thinking about the, th these militarization issues in space? Mm -hmm. Yes, Michael, as you mentioned, the Japanese uh, constitution uh, prohibits to have a military, so we call it a self-defense. And, uh, but self-defense does not, you know, exclude uh, securing the assets in space. So that's why uh, we, you know, are continue to develop uh, space technologies, including uh, monitoring space debris to protect our satellites and monitoring, you know, uh, communication through satellites to for the self-defense uh, communication or navigation. We have now on uh, navigation satellites as well. So uh, I think in having those kind of space assets is, you know, encouraging in Japan as well. On that, uh, on that note, you know, with, with Russia withdrawing from the International Space Station and, you know, China talking about a more independent program, we have a couple of questions that ask, you know, all, is there going to be a new International Space Station at some point? And if so, will it be something like a collaboration between the US and Japan and Europe? Mm -hmm. Yes, good question. Because, you know, for the lower Earth orbit, ISS may be expanded through 2028 or something, but uh, it gets older and then maintenance cost is, you know, increasing. So we cannot extend beyond 2030. So at some point we have to, you know, terminate ISS program. And so that's why we are developing a lunar gateway uh, around the lunar orbit, but it's not a low Earth orbit. So for low Earth orbit, we need commercialization like an um, SpaceX or Axiom uh, startup companies. It's in developing a, its commercial space station. So those kind of activities is very important to have an, uh, of course, the important for the business wise, but also for the international collaboration wise as well, because we can send, you know, the Japanese astronauts to the commercial space station, do some government experiments. So we need a collaboration between the public and the private section as well. So on that, 
On that question of sort of public-private cooperation, we have a, a question in the Q&A that asks about the what the how we balance essentially the commercial incentives in space with research. And mm -hmm. the example the question gives are light reflections from satellite constellations that interrupt telescope observations. Right. So how do we how do you think we should be balancing the interests of private industries with scientific research and you know with where do they support each other and where do they conflict? Yes. You, that's true. As the number of satellites is increasing, the life, light reflection is getting bigger problem. So uh, we are, you know, requesting to do some, uh, you know, special painting on the surface of the satellite so that it will reduce the light reflecting from the satellite and so on. And I think SpaceX is working on it and uh, doing some experiments to reduce the reflection. But it's not perfect. And as many satellites are on orbit, of course, it will disturb their observations. So another way is to create a space telescope, like a Hubble telescope or even we can create a telescope on the moon to, you know, not to be disturbed by a atmosphere or some, you know, radiomagnetic field. So that would be an option. And of course, but still we need to protect and keep balance between uh, research and uh, commercialization. So we need a conversation to do our best. Oh, a telescope on the moon. It sounds like we're gonna be using the moon for a lot uh, in, mm -hmm. uh, in the, in the in, yeah, in the coming right. decades exactly moon is getting more important for many purposes right because it sounds like the moon then so the moon essentially becomes a base for a lot of different kinds of activities in space mm -hmm. yes and in you know the last couple of years we found uh, lots of ice and water on the moon closer to the polar area, especially the South Pole contains, you know, so, you know, tons of water. So that's why our, you know, exp space exploration on the moon is getting more active recently. And, but uh, the water is, it doesn't exist, you know, evenly. It, you know, exists only around the pole area or some other area. So everybody wants to have activities in a specific area. So that's why we need to rush the activities right now. So once we get to that uh, area first, then we can preserve that you know, certain amount of area as a safety zone. And so that some other companies or some other nations cannot approach it. So it's kind of, you know, uh, you know, territory race. So it's, well, good or bad aspects, but I think, you know, that's why the Artemis Accord is important mm. to secure some safety zone, but at the same time to, you know, communicate among each parties to for any conflicts between it. So those kind of mechanisms is getting more important as well because we don't have any international laws for to coordinate that. Right. And that, now, now you're making me nervous again when you talk about uh, you talk about competition for territory on the moon. Mm -hmm. But it's happening actually. Well, then let's. Uh, we've just got a couple minutes left, so. The, let me get one more question in, and then, uh, and then I, I think I already know what I want to ask. Uh, what I want to ask last, the, the, uh, sorry, I was just scrolling through the the questions here. Mm -hmm. The, actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip to the question that I want to ask at the end because I think we we might be able to have some back and forth on that. Which is what, when you think about what you want human presence in space to look like you know mm -hmm. in the future mm -hmm. so so not just 10 years from now but 50 years from now or 100 years from now or 200 years from now oh, what do you want the human what? presence in space to look like mm -hmm. you know how how far do you think we should expand in the solar system and you know it's, mm -hmm. and, and that would obviously take some pressure off earth from a population perspective or from a pollution yeah. perspective but how far should we go? What, what, what's your dream? <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, I 
think at least you know we should expand to Mars because it's our you know neighbor planet and it's very close to the Earth and we can you know we we, we would be able to change the Mars environment to be habitable one in if we want. So I you know the lunar and Mars would be our within our you know mm, let's say ecosystem territory in the next decades or to, you know, in the next century. And far beyond that, well, I'm not sure, but eventually, of course, human beings will be expanding in the solar system, I hope. Because, you know, once we have some outposts somewhere on the moon, then it will get much easier to expand further because escape velocity doesn't change so much. So that's why we can expand easier from the moon. From the Earth, you know, it's difficult due to the heavy gravity, but from the moon or well, from Mars, it's getting much easier. And my hope is to create some, you know, school or university on the moon. And, you know, for the younger generation, get together all over the world to the moon and get some education together. Then after returning back to the earth and then for each region and countries, then probably those generations will be able to work together more internationally. Because when I started in USA as an exchange student, well, I feel in those person to person relationship will influence me so much and I will really appreciate those US Japan, you know, relationship and the partnership at the time. So those, you know, next generations will have more sense of collaboration. So which is my hope. Wow. Well, I, uh, I'm happy to volunteer to be a professor at the first moon uh, university. Yeah, and... isn't it wonderful. How about Perry <laughs> Wildhouse in the branch on the moon? <laughs> I love it. We're, we're expanding. We're expanding. Exactly. It's going to be great. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Yamazaki, for taking the time to speak with us today. I, I, I wish we could, we, could, we could keep this going, but unfortunately, we're out mm -hmm. of time. And we appreciate your taking the time to speak with us about the challenges and opportunities of the new space age. And, and thank you to our audience for joining us for today's event. Uh, as always, you can access a recording of this conversation on our YouTube channel. You can stay connected with Perry Worldhouse and learn about our future programs by joining our mailing list and following us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Perry Worldhouse. We will drop links to all of those in the chat. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ms. Yamazaki. It's been, uh, it's been tremendous uh, to have you here with us uh, virtually this year. We, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in Philadelphia uh, at some point. And, and thanks again uh, to our audience. Uh, have a great day, everybody.